Hi everyone, and welcome to the 2020 Cal Speaker Series. My name is Erin Fair and I'm the archivist of the Sequoia National Research Center at the University of Arkansas at Little Rock. This Cal Speaker Series event honors Rabbi Ira Sanders. Rabbi Sanders built an unforgettable legacy through his passionate advocacy for social justice and the many initiatives he founded to better the lives of others. Dr. Sanders served as rabbi at Congregation B'nai Israel for 38 years. Sanders, who lived in Little Rock from 1926 until his death in 1985, was an outspoken supporter of racial integration, equal opportunity, and women's rights. The speaker will answer questions at the end of the session, so feel free to type in any questions you may have in the chat box in Zoom. This year, 2020, marks the 50th anniversary of the publication of D. Brown's Bury My Heart at Wounded Knee. The Central Arkansas Library System and the Bobby L. Roberts Library of Arkansas History and Art are celebrating the anniversary of this American classic with a series of lectures and exhibits that recognize the enduring importance and power of Brown's groundbreaking volume. This program is made possible in part by a grant from the v Division of Arkansas Heritage funded by the 1-8 cent conservation sales tax amendment 75. For more details about our celebration events, go to cals.org. I wanna to begin today's program with an acknowledgement of the native peoples who stewarded this land for generations. I would like to acknowledge this program is being held on the traditional lands of the Quapaw, Osage and Caddo peoples and pay my respect to elders, both past and present. Thank you for joining us this evening. David Troyer is an Ojibwe from the Leech Lake Reservation in Northern Minnesota. The author of four previous novels, most recently Prudence, and two books of nonfiction, he has also written for the New York Times, Los Angeles Times, Esquire, Slate, and the Washington Post, among others. He has a PhD in anthropology and teaches literature and creative writing at the University of Southern California. Please give a warm virtual welcome to David Troyer. Hello, can you hear me? Can you, can you hear me yet? Yes. Oh, good. Hey, everyone. Um, uh, thanks for coming to the middle of the uh, internet <laughs> to come together for this event. Thanks for having me. I, of course, wish that I was actually in um, Arkansas for this. Uh, I was looking forward to that so much, um, but we have to do what we have to do to keep each other safe. So. I'm looking forward to the time when we can all gather and raise a glass and celebrate our lives. I should also, one second, hold on. I apologize. Um, you might hear the barking of dogs or the screaming of children in the background. And that's also a facet of our, um, <laughs> of our uh, current moment. So I apologize for those in, uh, interruptions. So um, I thought for today's program, what would be um, hopefully most interesting is if I could just talk a little bit about how I came to write The Heartbeat of Wounded Knee, um, what went into it and what's behind it and, and what I hoped to, to accomplish in it. Um, so I should start by saying, or by confessing really that I, uh, for the most of my writing career, which I guess started 25 years ago, I had no ambition to be a nonfiction writer. I was a fiction guy. And I felt that novels in particular was where the action was. You know, when they asked um, John F. Kennedy why he wanted to be president, he said, because that's where the power is. And I felt similarly about writing fiction. I um, had really no desire to stray beyond that. I was very content because, I mean, let's face it, you know, the life of a fiction writer is a life spent making things up. And my parents would probably say that that suits, suited my personality. But, uh, but some things happened um, rather close to home that changed my course. And so what happened was in 2005, there was a school shooting at the Red Lake Reservation in Northern Minnesota, which is just up the road from my reservation of Leech Lake. And uh, 
it's the same tribe, uh, really the same community. We have so many friends and family on the Red Lake Reservation. And I had worked for years in the school where the school shooting had uh, taken place. And my mom had worked in that school. My dad had been a teacher in that school. So we were deeply bound to both the place and in particular to that, to that school. So in 2005, when Jeffrey Weiss um, killed his grandfather, who was a tribal police officer and his grandfather's girlfriend and took his service weapons and drove to the school in his squad car and opened fire on his school, killing his classmates and his teachers uh, and the staff in what was at the time the, the second worst school shooting in American history, um, only surpassed by, by Columbine. I was really, really deeply affected by that. And when it happened, I was actually in New York City staying with a friend and my brother called me and told me the news and I turned on the television and I kept flipping channels trying to find information. And in the days that followed, I you know, would page from you know, you know, website to website trying to get information. And I got really, really upset that first night and then in the subsequent days. And as I was flipping channels, my and I was starting to curse at the TV and, and I was getting very frustrated and my friend couldn't figure out why I was so upset. And he asked me why. And I said, look, man, I'm trying to find out what happened. I want to know what happened. I want to know how many people are hurt. I want to know what's happening next. I said, but none of these places are reporting anything like that. The only thing that I'm hearing is the same old sad story about reservations because Everywhere I turned, it was more or less the same headline on a poor remote reservation tragedy strikes. And sometimes they said again, as though reservation life and reservations themselves were just one unending tragedy. I said, that's not the news. That's just the same old sad story and I'm sick of it. I wanna know what happened. But I was really upset. Um, and so as time passed, um, my anger did not abate. I, I got more and more upset. And that week I was meeting with a, a publisher and I was talking to him about why I was so angry. And I said, look, you know, everyone thinks they know what reservations mean, but nobody really knows. You know, everyone thinks that there are these, these terrible places where, where good ideas go to die, you know, places that are basically just basins of suffering and really that and and nothing more i said but there, there's more to it than that they're more important than that i said we we love our reservations for really good reasons not because they suck and it, it seems stupid to have to say that out loud but i have to say that in this editor who was listening to me rant um he said, well, you know, I've always wanted to publish a book about reservations and what they mean and why they exist and where they're going. They seem unique to this country. Canada too has them, of course, but they seem like a, a uniquely American thing. And I've always wanted to publish a book about it. What native writers write nonfiction? And for those of you who are tuned in, this is career advice. Um, when you're presented with an opportunity, you lie. And so I lied. And I said, well, sadly, only I. Um, alone among native writers write nonfiction, which wasn't even remotely true. Uh, there were a lot of native folk who wrote nonfiction and I had never written any. So I was hired <laughs> to write the book that would end up becoming Res Life, but it was not a straight line to, to, to the end of that book. I knew, I only knew what I didn't want to do. I only knew that the kinds of stories I didn't want to tell. And what I didn't want to do was to write the same old sad story about reservations. But that's not quite enough, really, to pull, pull off writing a book. And so there was a lot of trial and error before I sort of figured it out. Because what I needed wasn't just alternative facts or a, a alternative history. I didn't need to unearth things that people didn't know exactly, although I, I did need to do that to some extent. I needed to find a whole new narrative shape because the problem is the dominant narrative for telling stories about native lives is the tragic mode, is the tragic narrative. And tragedy going all the way back 
to Aristotle, um, who, you know, Aristotle himself defined tragedy as a drama posed in such a way as to elicit the twin feelings of pity and fear, which result in a in an intense uh, intensification, which produces a catharsis, a sort of an unburdening of emotion. That's what tragedy does. That's what Romeo, Romeo and Juliet does. That's what uh, Macbeth does. And that was the dominant mode, really the only mode for telling Indian stories, tragedy, or what people perceive to be its opposite, you know, a story of hope, which to me is really just the other side of the tragic coin, because both stories change nothing. They don't change what we think. They don't change what we see. And most importantly, they don't change how we see things. And really, that's the job of to me, of being a writer, but also of being an educator. The job isn't just to teach my students new things. My job is to use books to teach them to see things differently, to think differently. So I, I needed some other kind of story with some other kind of shape because a different kind of story with a different shape could lead to different outcomes. I struggled and I failed and I struggled and I failed and it took me a long, long time. Um, that book was seven years in the making before I realized that I had to flip the script that if we're used to seeing native communities as places where there's less of everything, as, as, as I've called it before, you know, if we're used to seeing native communities as basins of suffering, we need to flip it around. And what happens if we see native communities as places where there's more of everything rather than less? Maybe more hardship, but also more humor. Maybe more poverty, but also more hustle. Maybe more crime, but also more laws and law enforcement. So, so what if I could see reservations and help other people see them as places not of deficit, but of surplus. Um, and that seemed to me to be the answer. And so after failing miserably for years to write the book with this idea of surplus of native communities and reservations in particular as places where there's just more of everything, not, not you know, less of America even, but, but more of it. And if you really wanna see America, if you really wanna see what this country is all about, the good and the bad, there's no place where that's more obvious and more evident than on reservations. So I finally succeeded in writing the book and I thought I was done with nonfiction. I felt like I had accomplished my mission and I was content to turn back to fiction, but something nagged at me. And what nagged at me was that res life was about reservations, but it wasn't really about native life more generally. And I have to tell you that living and working and traveling around people, I talk to a lot of people and invariably, like I get, you know, passionate and heated and I say things like, you know, we've been doing more than just suffering. You know, we've been, we've been living you know, like big lives. Like we've been, you know, we've been doing lots of things and, you know, like we're still here and we're not just here, but we're active and we're energetic and we're getting things done. And then people say, well, what are you doing? What, what book can I read about what you've been up to? And then I struggled to name a title, read this, read that. If you want a picture of what native people generally have been up to. So it seemed like there was more work to be done. And then I remembered um, Dee Brown's classic, Bury My Heart at Udini. Dee Brown's book published in 1970 is still the best selling book about Native American history ever published. I think there are over 10 million copies in print. And it's never been out of print in the last 50 years. It's been translated into 17 different languages, I believe. Everyone, it seems, has a copy or has read it or has heard of it. And I remembered reading that book when I was in college and as, as chance would have it, I read D. Brown's book in 1990 on the 100th anniversary of the massacre at Wounded Knee, which took place in December of 1890. 
So it was kind of portentous timing. I remember being a college student, far from home, far from my tribe, feeling very lonely, reading that book and having really complicated feelings and reaction to it. Because on one hand, Dee Brown was a passionate, liberal, um, you know, um, compassionate ally of Native people. And he spent years of his life writing Bury My Heart at Udini and bringing our history into the public, into public consciousness and into the national discourse. And so I felt really lifted up by Dee Brown on one hand, but on the very first page of his book, he says something to the effect of, in my book, I focus on the American West during the Plains Indian Wars, a time of violence and greed and cries for freedom made, at those, made by those who already possess it at the expense of those who didn't, something to that effect. I start in 1850 and I end in 1890 at the massacre at Wounded Knee, and this is more of a direct, direct quote. I end at the massacre at Wounded Knee where the culture and civilization of the American Indian was destroyed, full stop. And on the second page of his book, he says, so if you happen to travel to a contemporary Indian reservation and notice the poverty and the hopelessness and the squalor, perhaps by reading my book, you will understand why. And so while I felt lifted up on one hand, I felt like Dee Brown was shoving me and my people and native people across the country by extension, I felt like he was shoving us in a rather premature grave because 1890, I felt, I felt in my bones was not the end of our tribes. It was not the end of our cultures and it was not the end of our civilization. But that is the dominant idea and Dee Brown, despite his many gifts and despite his generosity, Dee Brown and his book, encouraged and cemented that idea in the American mind that native people were of the past, that we were over and that our lives essentially ended when the frontier closed because the frontier was closed in 1890, officially by the government. And that stayed with me, you know? So I thought, well, there needs to be a book. Everyone's asking what they can read. And, and no matter what I say, no, no one believes me that we're really living today. People could admit intellectually that there may be Indians, but we're not really living. We're just kind of perpetual sufferers, you know, scattered around, you know, the American landscape in these dusty little forgotten corners of it. In, in no one's mind, we're sort of native people, modern, vibrant, active. In no one's mind, we're, we're native communities a part of America. We were simply in it, but not of it. Throwbacks, if we existed at all. And so it seemed to me that I needed, there needs to be a follow-up to Dee Brown's book. So I began scheming. I was gonna start in 1890 when Dee Brown stops. And I was gonna write a book with the opposite thesis attached to it. That 1890 was not the end, but rather 1890 was a low point perhaps the, the lowest point for tribes across the country since our contact with, first contact with the Europeans in 1492. But it was a point from which we have been emerging in surprising ways. And so as I embarked on this book, I remembered reading, an, I remembered another book that I read around the same time that I read Dee Brown's book. And it was admittedly a really, really boring book by Karl Marx um, called The 18th Brumaire of Louis Bonaparte. I recommend that you don't read it um, if you value your time <laughs> and your sanity. But he says something really, really cool on the very first page. He says something to the effect of, all men make history, they just don't always make it as they please. They don't make it with tools of their choosing, but they make it nonetheless. And as I imagined my follow-up to Dee Brown, that quote kept coming back to me as the perfect way to think about Native history. That we're not just victims of history. History isn't just a process that happened to us, 
but rather something that we've been making, not always from positions of privilege, not always from positions of power, almost never with tools of our choosing, but we've been making history nonetheless. And so I embarked on the book and it took a while. I imagine it was gonna be a short, forceful, fierce book and it ended up being something like 700 pages in manuscript. And my editor um, did some serious cutting um, and she's amazing. So she, she really made it more readable than I think it was uh, first go around. And um, I had an agenda, of course, you know, not just to refute Dee Brown, not just to explore the ways in which Native people have been making our own lives, but to address a couple other problems I see in the general discourse, which are there's a tendency to think or to only tune into Native stories for a couple weeks out of the year prior to Thanksgiving. And if people do manage to tune into us and our lives, they do it in the manner of, in the way that people volunteered after school programs, for example, as a kind of liberal social act, as though tuning into a native story and feeling all these intense emotions, you know, so if you're not native, like you tune in and you feel guilt and you feel anxiety and you feel, you feel desperately sad and people mistake their intense emotions for political action. And I'm here to tell you on the eve of possibly the most important election of our lifetime, that feeling something intensely is not the same thing as acting. I just want to posit that right now. But that's the way that people consume Indian stories. And I really want to prove that that's kind of the wrong way to go about it. But rather, if you really wanna understand American history, if you really wanna take this country's temperature, if you really wanna know what this country is about, if you wanna see the clearest expressions of its worst impulses and its highest ideals, you have to know Native history. Native history is American history and American history does not come into focus unless you know Native history. So for example, and people get tired of me saying these things, but I'm just, you know, I'm passionate, I can't help it, but <clears throat> America's first revolutionary act was to dump tea in Boston Harbor. We all know this. What we don't remember as often is that the colonists dressed up as Mohawk Indians to dump tea in Boston Harbor. And they, they did this because one of the reasons why we went to war with England was over the issue of who got to colonize and appropriate and make money off of Indian lands west of the 13 colonies? Who got to make money off of us? The crown or the colonists? That was a huge question. We were at the center of it. Flipping ahead after the revolution when they're looking around for a new form of government never before seen on the face of the earth, to whom did they look? They looked to the Iroquois Confederacy again and they modeled the, the revolutionaries and the founding fathers modeled our separation of powers after the Iroquois model. That's why we have a legislative and executive judicial. Flipping forward again, the first test of, of states' rights versus federal power was not over the question of slavery. That came later. The first test was over the removal of native people from the American Southeast to what was then Indian territory and what's now Oklahoma. That was the first test. Flipping forward even more, the United States Supreme Court between the years 1965 and 1995 heard more cases about federal Indian law than any other genre of law. More than reproductive rights, more than civil rights, more than banking, more than immigration. So as the country was trying to figure out what it was, and what its character was during and in the wake of civil rights and the Vietnam War and the Pentagon Papers and Watergate, it did so in the courts in relation to the question of Indian sovereignty. And to bring us up to the present day, 
The pipeline protests in North Dakota over the Dakota Access Pipeline has been framed as sort of cowboys versus Indians, as, as the white government getting Indians down, framed that way by the former chairman of Standing Rock. And I disagree. I think what we saw at Standing Rock and what we still see, because it's ongoing, is a question of what's more important in this country? What kind of country do we want to be? The kind of country that privileges the common good or corporate profit. That's the battle that we saw at Standing Rock. And that's the battle that Native people were fighting on behalf of all Americans. So you can't understand this country without understanding us. And so that's my agenda. Um, that's what I hope to accomplish. I want to show that truth. I wanted to explore that relationship. Um, I wanna close a little bit by talking about my father who's not native and who's passed away now. Um, but I wanna talk about him and his memory since, since um, given you know, how and in whose honor this talk is endowed. Um, my father was a Jewish Holocaust survivor and he fled to the United States, lived here, you know, grew up here eventually and um, raised two families here. Before he died, and he, he died of dementia and Alzheimer's, so he was um, losing his mind. You know, it's, a, it's a tough way to go, especially for someone like him who survived the Nazis and everything else by you know, virtue of his wits. Um, he died the same week I started writing this book. And shortly before he died, I was, I was grumpy about something. I don't remember what it was, something the government was doing or had done. You know, and I was frustrated and I threw my hands up and I'm like, dad, how can you stand it? He says, what are you talking about? And he was so far gone by then. I thought I'd heard everything that he'd had to say. And there wasn't much left really there. And I said, well, this is your country of choice, you know? I was born here and for me to sort of give this place up is, means I'd have to give up my tribe and my tribal homelands and I'm not prepared to do that, but you chose this place. And so it must feel different. Like, how can you stand it? And he looked at me like I was an idiot. He, had, he was good at that look, by the way. I practice it on my children, but I'm not as good at it. And he said, look, no other country wanted me, okay? He's like, you know, Austria tried to kill me, Germany tried to kill me, Belgium didn't want me, France didn't want me, England and Ireland didn't want me. The only place that would take me in was this, this place. He said, so this country saved my life. And so my job is to save it from itself. My job is to make it better and to, to keep it from doing the bad things it would, it would otherwise do without me. That's the deal. It saved me, I save it. That's how it works. He's like, what's so hard to understand about that? And that was really on my mind as I sat down to write this, the, to start writing this the week after he passed away. Um, Cause that is the deal. And I think native people have been doing that since the beginning of this country. We have been struggling with it, against it at times urging it always to express the best parts of its ideals. So with that thought on the eve of this election, I think it's time to close down the talk and open it up to questions. Aaron, is that, are we on time? Yeah, you're doing great. All right. Uh, we actually ended a little early, so okay. More time um, for questions. we've got plenty of time for questions. So um, I will start it with Kay Lundgren. Hi, Kay. Um, she says, um, I'm a Minnesotan as well. One of my ahas in life is realizing that I'm living in a country of conquered countries, the South and the ramifications of Black lives and Native peoples. These conquered people influence the U.S. as a whole, I feel. But I never hear this insight of living with conquered people in the 21st century. Do you think this DNA of conquered people contributes to our division as a nation? Um, 
Well, thanks for your question, Kay. And hi to a fellow Minnesotan. Um, I would push back on this idea that, it, that, that my people are a conquered people. I mean, to put it bluntly, if the United States government had won, if it had its way, we wouldn't be here. The Lakota wouldn't be here. The Makah wouldn't be here. The over 500 extant native tribes, we would not be here today. We're not conquered, you know? The Seminole, for instance, never lost a battle in Florida. We're still there, <laughs> you know? So I don't admit defeat. We've had setbacks, you know? And uh, <laughs> there's a great anecdote that might sort of help illustrate this, you know, this attitude. My, um, my ex-mother-in-law, Seneca, and uh, I guess she's Tanawanda Seneca and they are a fierce people. And their tribal offices burnt down at some point. Um, I don't remember when, but they burnt down and, and she was kind of groaning. She's like, all of our enrollment records, you know, which we kept in, kept in these ledgers, you know, like handwritten, all of that stuff is burnt up. Like, she's like, I'm not sure what we're gonna do. And I said, well, didn't you, don't you guys do what other tribes do? It's like, you know, copies of those records are kept by the Bureau of Indian Affairs. Like, don't you, didn't you send your, your enrollment records to, to the Bureau of Indian Affairs. And she looked at me with the same look that my dad looked at me. And, and she's like, in what world would we send our records to the enemy? <laughs> she's like, who would, who would do such a thing? Of course we didn't send it to the government. They're the enemy. So not conquered. Um, I, I do have a comment to add uh, on that. The Chickasaw of Oklahoma, their uh, motto is unconquered and unconquerable. Yep. So. <laughs> yep. And we're, I'm excited to see what happens in Oklahoma now. After the McGirt decision, that was a huge win in Oklahoma. Yes. That's very recent. And, yes. Uh, uh, lots of people are trying to figure out what that means and because it means a lot, but they're not really for sure what it means yet. <laughs> I think it, it's great news. I mean, the Chickasaw and the Choctaw mm -hmm. and those guys down there are so freaking smart. They're so good at organizing. Like Oklahoma is going to be so much better off with some natives in charge. I'm telling you, like they've got it going on. They are competent. They are brilliant. They are fierce. They are protective, you know, Yep. And um, I'm excited. Me too. We have another question from Susan and she asks, what books would you recommend for kids and teens to read about modern native life? Oh my gosh. Um, folks, I'm here to tell you that it's a great time to be indigenous and it's a great time to be a reader. There are so many native authors writing today at, in all genres and at all levels. Um, there are some incredible fantasy novels written by a, a Diné writer named Rebecca Roanhorse, for example. Um, great horror stuff written by Stephen Graham Jones. An awesome thriller that just came out by someone else called Winter Counts. Um, lots of adult titles, lots of histories, lots of memoirs. There's actually, um, a young adult version of a really good history book, it, not so much modern history, called An Indigenous People's History of the United States mm -hmm. by Rebecca Dunbar Ortiz. And there's a YA version of that. And if I can get my butt in gear soon, um, within a year, I hope there's gonna be a YA version of The Heartbeat of Wounded Knee. So kids from ninth grade you know, on up you know, should have a shorter, more colorful, more zippy, version of my book um, to enjoy. So there's a lot of stuff out there, you know, a lot of stuff. Yeah, um, I know that Debbie Reese has a blog that she keeps uh, up that um, recommends books for kids and teens about natives and yeah, yeah. kind of breaks it down into whether it's um, appropriate or not. Yeah. 
Um, along that same note, we have Charles Grayson asking if you have any recommendations for someone interested in writing a book. <laughs> um, <laughs> be ready for disappointment, dude. It's, <laughs> you know, I mean, just, just to speak about the writing business a little bit and my particular corner of it. Um, I published my first novel when I was 24. I got lucky and I thought I'd won the lottery and I thought it was just going to be smooth sailing ever since. And it was not, um, it was, it always felt like two steps forward, one step back. And, you know, the fame and riches I expected when, in my 24 year old sort of very stunted brain did not materialize. Um, it didn't get reviewed very widely. It got purchased even less widely. Ditto for the second, ditto for the third and the fourth, you know, and Res Life was the, my fifth book was the first one that actually did okay. It wasn't until my sixth book that the New York Times thought it might be a great idea to review me. My sixth book, 20 years in, you know, it took a while. So I wish I had, you know, an answer for you, Charles, but it's hard and more often than not, relatively thankless work. Um, and with the heartbeat of Moonini, I got lucky. And I don't know that, that that book's success has much more to do with anything other than luck, to be honest. Okay, we have another question from Maya. And she says she is a non-native individual from Texas and she's currently taking a general course this semester about Native American history. Um, and she's found that Native and American history are intertwined. And um, I find it undeniably important for people to know more about Native history. Do you have any advice as to how I can increase awareness about Native history while amplifying Native voices without talking over them? Maya, it sounds like you're already on it. Like you're, you're reading the writing by, you know, writings by Native people, you're, you're talking about them. Um, and it sounds like you are amplifying them. I don't see the danger there of, of you talking over a co or co-opting. You know, what's really interesting is that um, there are 5 million native people in the United States. In 1890, there were less than 200,000 of us. That's how bad it was in 1890. There are over 5 million of us now. There are more native people than there are people who identify as Jewish. It's roughly equal. And there are almost twice as many native people as there are people who identify as say Muslim American, just, just for comparison. That was the 2010 census. And I think the 2020 census is gonna be even bigger. There's so many native voices out there and we are speaking, talking, you know? We have senators, we have writers, we have judges, we have tech people, we have doctors. And the crazy thing about native life is that social media seems to have been invented for us. You take, you know, relatively poor, widely scattered communities that lack infrastructure, lack, you know, visibility, and you give us smartphones and native Twitter and native Instagram and native Facebook are vibrant. I mean, you can follow those people. You can repost the articles that they that they write and post, you know, there's so many different ways. Maya, it seems like you're doing a good job. So, you know, keep doing it. Okay, we have another question from Darlene and she asks, how did you go about collecting and studying the history of the many tribes over the decades since 1890? Yeah, so um, I knew, as I said in you know, my talk earlier, like I was really clear with myself that I, I was really, I was really strident about the fact that I wanted to write a book about Native American life, not Native American death. So it seemed equally clear to do that. I had to go out and talk to people. There's just no other way to, to tell this story because, and, and, and also in addition to that, I really feel like history isn't just a set of events, you know, in the past. 
but history is a force that lives through us, that is expressed in our behaviors, our personalities, our experiences. So to capture that history and to really dig into the idea of Native American life as opposed to Native death, I had to go out and talk to people. I traveled for years all over the country interviewing people for this book. And I have to say, like, I may seem sort of engaged and energetic and friendly, and, and I am those things, I guess, but I'm also kind of shy, too. And so it was really difficult, and, and it was really nerve-wracking and, and anxiety-inducing to travel to some reservation where I didn't know anybody and talk to people and, you know, ask them to share their lives. And, but then people were very generous you know, with their time and their energy. And that was really the, the best part of the book. For me, the best part of the experience of writing the book was talking to people because this is the thing, like the tragic mode that I was talking about earlier, you know, it erases us as human beings. You know, a tragic telling like turns us into a statistic and turns our lives into a condition. So to counteract that, to fight that, I had to talk to real life living people and I had to notice the details of their lives, what made them the people they are, their habits, their, the, how they moved, how they talked, you know, what they wanted to eat, you know, what they didn't like, what they did, their passions, you know, that's what I had to pay attention to. So in answer to your question, Darlene, I, one thing is I had to go out and talk to people. Of course, I had to also consult the historical record. So I had to read a lot of books, but I also had to put myself into the book. It didn't seem fair to me. It didn't seem right to ask people to risk their lives, to risk you know, exposing themselves in the pages of the book without assuming some risk of my own. So I had to talk about my life and my family and, and our struggles and triumphs, I guess, too. So that's, kind of why the book has the shape it does, which is a combination of history, reportage, and memoir, so. Very good. I, I really like this question from Judy. She asked, did you have a chance to meet Dee Brown and talk to him about your book? I didn't, I didn't, uh, I wish I had. I, I, he didn't pass away that long ago, mm -hmm. I, is he, right? Is that right? I don't, I believe it wasn't very long ago. I'm not a hundred percent sure. <laughs> um, yeah, no, I didn't, you know, unfortunately, I think I would have liked that. I mean, I would have liked to have met him when I was older and more mature and not an angry college student who was mad at his book, you know? <laughs> he probably would have um, appreciated that as well. <laughs> probably. I was insufferable. I really was. I wouldn't wish me on anyone at that age, you know? <laughs> Um, Mary asks, and I kind of think it's an interesting question since we just finished the census 2020. Yeah. Um, and she asks who counts as native and how is that decided? Well, have I got a book for you? Well, I've got a few books. Um, <laughs> I talk about that in Res Life. I talk <laughs> about that a little less, but some in the heartbeat of wounded knee, but, and I can't believe I'm doing this because we're in fierce competition. Um, my older brother, Anton, wrote a book called Everything You Wanted to Know About Indians But Were Afraid to Ask. Yeah. And in that book, he talks for, a, in a, and he's a great personable writer. He talks about how enrollment works. What people don't understand, of course, is that we're a unique category. You know, native, not all Native people, for various reasons, but Native people are enrolled citizens of sovereign nations in addition to being citizens of the United States. How enrollment, how to become an enrolled citizen of your tribe depends on the tribe because it's very complicated. Some are based on lineal descent. Can you trace an ancestor back to a certain treaty role from the 1800s? Some are by blood quantum. You have to be a quarter blood from the tribe or half. But I do want to note that sort of when people introduce themselves, people I don't know introduce themselves like, well, I'm half Indian. I'm like, okay, then you're not for real. Because <laughs> we, we don't talk about ourselves that way. I don't, I don't understand myself as being half native. 
because there's enrollment, which is a political designation, and there's culture, which is not, you know? And so nobody, there's no sort of list of like, are you culturally native? That's something the culture itself, like you're raised in, you're born into it, you're raised there, you're, you're part of it, you know? So, I mean, there are people who are culturally Ojibwe, but who actually aren't actually Ojibwe by blood. They just, you know, I know somebody who was um, not born yet when his mom married a native guy. And then he was born with a native dad, not his bio dad, raised on the Leech Reservation his entire life. He's native by culture, but not by blood, not enrolled, you know? so. Cultural and enrollment are different things, as is identity. Identity is not the same thing as culture. Identity is something you construct. They're multiple and overlapping. Culture is something you're born in. It's like, it's just the air you breathe. You don't choose your culture. Enrollment is something else completely. Yeah. Okay, well, um, I think I've gone through all of the questions that were typed in the chat, right. but I actually had a question. So if anybody has thinks of one, go ahead and put it in the chat. Um, I, um, I had shared with you yesterday when we um, met that my boss knew your dad. Yeah. And he had told me that um, your dad was a Holocaust survivor. Mm. And, um, and then you brought it up tonight, which kind of reminded me, um, do you find that your perspective has been impacted by the parallels between like the Jewish upbringing and culture and the native culture? Like, do you see that at all? I mean, it's funny you should ask. I mean, I was never raised around Jewish people. Mm -hmm. I was raised in the Lushik Reservation where there are, there are very few Jewish people. <laughs> and the Germans did a very good job at trying to destroy my father's family. They got most of them. My father and his parents and two cousins, and one uncle survived. Everyone else was murdered. Wow. So... I didn't have a chance. I wasn't, and I wasn't raised among the few that survived. I was raised among my native family. And so I always felt like an outsider in, in Jewish spaces. Like I felt like an imposter, you know, <laughs> um, that said, you know, that heritage and my father's sort of, cause he was a talker. He talked about everything all the time. Like you could not shut my dad up, you know, <laughs> for which I'm very grateful now, but not so grateful when I was a kid. You know, I have to roll my eyes. I'm like, oh, again, seriously? Do I have to hear the story again, you know? And, yeah. um, but I was very conscious of that culture and that legacy and, and proud of it, you know, of being Jewish and being his son, you know? Mm -hmm. And I was very conscious of that legacy, you know? My father, for his part, when he got to the Leech Lake Reservation, he ended up teaching high school English. Because you know what happens in America when you're a, a, a Jewish refugee, you know, first language German speaker who picks up English as a second language and Japanese as a third? You end up teaching Shakespeare to native kids on the reservation. That's what you do. That's what happens in this country. You know? And um, But he said, he's like, you know, I got to the reservation and after being sort of unwelcome and treated like an outsider everywhere else in this country and in Europe, I finally felt at home. I felt like I was in a place where I understood the people and they understood me and accepted me. And they did. They, you know, my uncle, my mom's brother, he's passed away now, but when he was dying and he's in the hospital, I was visiting him and he's like, you know, I love my res. He's like, because here you can be any damn kind of person you want to be, you know, and no one bats an eye. You can be as weird as you want. And he's not wrong. He's not wrong. And so my father was not liked by everybody, of course. He was, he could be abrasive and loud and whatever, but he was accepted, you know? He was a part of the community and he 
wanted to become more Indian, he didn't make the place more Jewish, <laughs> you know? <laughs> so, um, it's a weird mix, I mean, to be honest. I mean, but as I've traveled around, I've met more and more native Jewish people, more than you'd ever thought existed. There, there, there are more of us than you, you, you would imagine. So. Wow. <laughs> um, did you have a chance to record any oral histories with your dad? Yeah, I mean, that's a question from, not Heather. sure. Um, Heather. Um, my dad talked so often and he repeated himself so much. Like I committed a lot of this, you know, stuff to memory, but we also, many of us recorded him and I recorded him and talked to him and interviewed him for, for Res Life. He's, he's in there quite a bit. And um, other people recorded him and his testimony and stuff is at the um, Holocaust Museum in Washington, DC. Oh, and wow. so you could hear him, like you hear his voice. He had a really funny voice, um, not funny, but, he was so good with languages. When he got to the States, he didn't speak English really at all. And he set out to learn it as quickly as he could. And he, they, land, they ended up settling in Ohio. And he listened to the radio to learn how to speak English. And he's such a quick study and he's such a good mimic. He ended up sounding like, he lost his German accent almost immediately. Wow. And, but the problem was he sounded like a 1940s radio announcer. <laughs> for his entire life because that's how he learned English so he sounded like a weird mid-Atlantic kind of Edward R. Murrow kind of accent he's like so when he'd yell at us when we were kids like that's how he'd sound he's like David Tony I'm very disappointed I'm very very disappointed you know and <laughs> time for dinner like he was like Edward R. Murrow like yelling at you um to do your dishes it, it was it was and we just start laughing because it was not scary um to be yelled at by Edward R. Murrow, and then he get even more mad because we're laughing at him, and it was yeah, it's comical. So. I actually have a an aunt who has been here since the fifties from Germany, oh, yeah? and she still has a very strong German accent. <laughs> <laughs> she but wasn't that, giving it up. <laughs> he was really good with languages, um, you know, and he was like, you know, they fled in nineteen thirty eight. He made it to the states by nineteen forty. Um, went to high school for a couple of years. And then when he was 17, he enlisted in the army because he wanted to go fight. It was 1944. And you have this fluent English and a German speaker whose mission in life is really just to kill Nazis. That's all he wants to do. And of course the US army in its brilliance, how do they use him? They pull him from his unit, they teach him Japanese and they send him to the Pacific. <laughs> because that's, that's what you do, right? <laughs> like, right, right. <laughs> that's what you do. Um, yeah. This, yeah, the army is always making good decisions, you know? For sure, for sure. Um, that kind of leads me to a question. Do you know if he ever had any contact with any of the code talkers during World War II? Because they were, a lot of those were in the Pacific. No. No, he, um, no, he ended up in the Philippines and near there. And then later in Okinawa, um, he got there cause they had to teach him Japanese. He got there like right during the last bit of fighting. Um, didn't know any of the code talkers. Um, and they were really embedded with the Marines more so than, than right. army. Yeah. And uh, so, no. Yeah. Well, I, I really appreciated your positivity spin. Um, I, I have to confess, I have not read your book yet, but I want uh, to now. <laughs> well, you know, it's getting cold outside, you know. It's time to start reading, yes. It's time to start reading, you know. Yeah. But, but I loved your idea of um, lifting up the Native voice and showing that Native people are everywhere in all fields and they're just like anybody else except they're native um mm -hmm. and and that's one of the things that we try to do at the sequoia national research center um and we we've really focused we we focus on contemporary natives and so hearing yeah. hearing your perspective and where you came from i can very much understand that and appreciate it yeah like my dad was, you know, talking about him a little bit more. I mean, and to your to your point, Aaron, like 
he was a very strange man in that when he was living in Yellow Springs, Ohio and sitting in at lunch counters and working in civil rights as a teenager, um, and he kept on pushing in that direction when he was in the army and then pushing in that direction again when he got out of the army and he was working in a steel mill near Chicago. And then later when he was working for the BIA and working with native people, he just assumed, it, it, it was just a, a matter of fact to him that African-American people, and then when he started to get to know native people and work with native people, native people were intelligent, competent, um, hardworking, and whatever they needed to get done, they could get done. And he was very uncharacteristically for the time, for a white person at that time, very unpaternalistic, mm -hmm. you know? So when he was working for the BIA and he'd go to a tribal community and there'd be a meeting about, you know, this or that. And, and he'd be like, the BIA used to tell Indians what they needed and what they wanted and what they could have and what they couldn't, you know? And my dad showed up and he's like, well, what do you want? <laughs> and this one community at White Earth said, well, we don't have a, the electric grid doesn't reach us and we want electric power for sanitation, for, for, for pumps, for, you know, we want electricity. He's like, okay, well, what are you going to do? What can you do to get it? You know, let's get it. Okay. That's what you want. Let's do it. And, yeah. you know, he was kind of a, really kind of a role model, you know, in so many ways. So yeah. Um, to your point, you know, my dad would have agreed with you. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, we are about four minutes till seven 30. Um, and it looks like we're finished with questions. So I guess we'll go ahead and end it unless you okay. have anything else to add. I'd just like to add um, how honored and happy and excited I am to be able to have this talk with you and to reiterate as well, sort of how sad I am that um, I'm not there in person. You know, being a writer, you sit in a room by yourself most of the time typing. That's what you do, you know, it's isolating. And one of the side effects of publishing a book is you get to go out in the world and you get to talk to people and you get to meet them and you get to bond over thought and ideas, things like that. And I really miss it now that we're in COVID and everyone's locked down. And, you know, so I hope, you know, in some fashion, you will have me in Arkansas when everything is over because I, I know for a fact that you all have killer food and, cool. <laughs> <laughs> and great company and I want both. So thanks for this. And I look forward to a chance to, to meet you all and, you know, do this in person. We do as well. So anytime you're, you're ready, all you've right. got a, you're an invitation. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you, Thank you. everyone. Bye now. Thank you everyone.